still listening to This Is My Story. I'm Ruth O'Reilly Smith. This show is all about sharing stories of how God's amazing love has changed lives forever. Today's episode is with Warren and Dee Furman. Warren, also known as Ace, from the popular 90s TV show Gladiators. After a high-profile career where he spent years in the celebrity spotlight, Warren realized that having everything he thought he wanted wasn't all it was cracked up to be. His story begins as a young boy in a humble working-class upbringing. Dad was probably the most honest man I'd, I'd, I'd met and the most hardworking. And I used to see that life would chew him up and spit him out. You know, he'd give people what they didn't deserve. He had no faith. When my brother died, mum and dad said, well, there can't be a God. If there was, you know, your, your brother wouldn't have died. And so, you know, he come up with these other sayings because life didn't obviously wasn't making a lot of sense to him. Um, and so he'd say stuff like, you know, skills pay the bills and, you know, work hard, play hard. And um, like I say, he was the hardest working uh, person I ever, I ever saw, really. Um, but we was always without. And so I saw a lot of our problems, a lot of mum and dad's arguments were from the fact that we didn't have enough money. I, I saw mum and dad living for the weekend, really. We could see that they were becoming a sum of their choices. You know, mum and dad both smoked. It was it was cool to smoke at that time. You know, I think a lot of the dangers weren't known. And um, and they saw, you know, they, it was like the Titanic. We could see they were heading for an iceberg. As a teenage boy, Warren was dreaming of a better life, a life where he didn't just get by. He saw a potential route to fame and fortune following in the footsteps of his idols. You look at the big celebrities now, the people that are winning in today's contemporary consumer culture, they're, they're the winners. They're bigger, better, faster, stronger. Look at The Rock, look at Vin Diesel, look at these people. And so in my years, you know, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, no different then, a celebrity culture. Uh, Sylvester Stallone, you know, one man taking on the world. And so I was like, yeah, I want to be like him. And, uh, and so I'd do anything to get there. And I put all my eggs in that basket. I trained harder than anybody. And I was looking at dad's ethic of, you know, working hard. So I'd do more, put more effort into the gym than anybody else. And yet I didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or Sylvester Stallone. But I was buying all the magazines and all the different protein powders and everything I could get my hands on. So I lived very poor because I was investing everything into that. Warren's dad, a roofer by trade, wasn't particularly supportive of his son's choice of career path. And at the same time, he was struggling to keep the family afloat as work began to dry up. I think his identity sometimes and his purpose was really questioned. I remember him pacing around the living room saying, oh, there's no work. What am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do? So it was it was tough growing up, but it was just enough for me to know I did not want to be a roofer. <laughs> and that caused a lot of problems between me and dad because he already said, you know, he had this fear that, um, you know, skills pay the bills. If you don't have skills, he's not doing his job as a parent. Um, and so he said, well, if you don't have a job by the time you're 16, I'm kicking you out because, you know, anything that consumes without producing fails and you're eating all the chicken and the tuna and the milk out of the fridge, all your brothers are working. You've got this idea of being Arnold Schwarzenegger. You're a dreamer. I'm not going to enable it. I'll kick you out. And that's what he did. Now homeless, Warren was given a place to stay at the local YWCA. It was here that he began to question his dreams of being a bodybuilder. And this identity crisis would lead him to make some pretty significant decisions. Once I found myself living in the YWCA, I was a bit like, actually, Dad's right. I've got no chance of being a superstar. I look nothing like my idols. My brothers are working now and they've got nice clothes and they're going places. And I'm really homeless uh, and I'm a dreamer. Uh, and I remember going to the gym a bit broken down. And one of the guys, you know, was quite a big guy. I, uh, I said to him, you know, um, I'm starting to think that there's not a future for me in bodybuilding. And he said to me, um, you're one of the most, you know, uh, 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 disciplined people in this gym. And actually, you have good genetics. You could go a long way. I said, I've trained harder than anyone. So how does that happen? He said, what are you taking? I was like, what are you talking about? What am I taking? You know, I'm like vitamin B, creatine. And he's like, no, no. What steroids? You must be taking steroids to look like that. And I said, no. And he said, well, if you haven't taken steroids at this point, if you take steroids now, you will look phenomenal. 
you know, you're not going to make the big money like your movie stars are making unless you make yourself different to everybody. You know, society celebrates individuality, being bigger, better, faster and stronger than everybody else. Yes, I had to go into the murky world of um, self-administration of anabolic steroids. Warren is keen to point out that looking back at this time, taking anabolic steroids is not something he would recommend. I sacrificed a lot. And, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in capitalism, it's very much, you know, the bigger the risk, the bigger the payoff. And so unfortunately, sometimes these things can come as a sacrifice to your health, whether that be through stress or whether that be through anabolic steroids. The safest way of taking anabolic steroids is intra intramuscular injection you know you can take tablets but actually they can really damage your liver um, but if you are actually using an injection you bypass the liver so you save your liver and so i was like well, hang on so you've now got to put a, an inch needle into your into your leg that sounds I'll, I'll be a complete loser i'll be a drug addict as well and the reality is if you're taking anabolic steroids or, or considering taking them they significantly shorten your life people say they're not addictive but actually they are because you imagine it you know if you're a skinny little kid and then you take anabolic steroids and they turn you into Superman, of course, as soon as you stop taking them and these big muscles disappear, um, it's going to be addictive because your whole identity is now is crumbling. It's like a, you know, a deck of cards that just collapses. Um, so they're very detrimental to your health. They're definitely not worth the sacrifice. Uh, and actually, it's illegal. So um, I wouldn't recommend anabolic steroids to anybody. But Warren was a young man, desperate to achieve his dream at any cost. I took the steroids and everything changed. All of a sudden, people were just noticing me. They were like, wow, you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? At that time, in the early 90s, the TV show Gladiators was primetime Saturday night viewing. And it was the biggest TV show in history and it had regular 16 million viewers. And I thought, well, if I can get on that show now. So I sent them in a letter and they invited me to a fitness trial. I went there and they gave me the job. A limousine picked me up from the uh, YWCA and it took me to Heathrow Airport and, uh, and I met all the gladiators who were big stars at the time, like Jet and Wolf. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and now all of a sudden I'm in this elite club, you know, I'm gonna be this superstar and they fly me first class in Mauritius. And um, that was the gladiator training camp. And with that, Warren became ace. So overnight I went from having nothing to having everything. I was a bit like at the time, I was like, wow, if there is a God, he must love me. I mean, who gets opportunities like this? This is incredible. Every day I had to pinch myself. Warren's meteoric rise led to fame and fortune as Ace became a household name. This led to an opportunity to have an important conversation with his father. He was sort of humbled, really, and he was like, oh, do you know what, do you know what, uh, uh, Warren, I was wrong. You were right, you've had this dream, you had a passion, you followed it with all your heart, and it's paid off. You can earn more, you know, in a, in, in a day than I can earn in a month. And, uh, you know, you're clearly a success. He says, I, I've only got to mention that my son is a gladiator and, and uh, I'm getting roofing work, you know, he said, and... Uh, uh, you know, people are seeing me as a success. So I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I gave you the wrong advice. You ignored it. It was a bone of contention between us, but I made a mistake. At the time, I was very much like, well, yeah, I know, Dad. I told you I'd be a success. You know, I told you that we 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 we, we shouldn't have lived a life of fear, limited by being uh, roofers. You know, there was there's a lot more to go at. You get one life, you got to go for it. That's what Arnie says. You know, looking back, I wish I could have that conversation again with my dad because I would have said, you know what, dad, you work harder than anyone I know. You're the most honest person that I know. You're full of integrity and um, you don't seem to have had a fair shake at it. But I resented him at that point because he had not made it easy for me.
Over time, Warren began to buy into his own hype, but it didn't take long for him to realise that being a celebrity was not what he thought it would be. You know, I believed that, you know, you get one life, that science had disproved God, and therefore, you know, if you're lucky to get 70, 80 years, like Arnold Schwarzenegger says, you want to live rich and live well and have abundance. Um, and so, you know, I bought right into that. But, you know, a lot of people die trying. You know, it's like if I get rich and famous, if I get the holidays I want or the partner I want or the wealth I want or the position I want, then I'll be happy. But actually, um, I learned through experience that that's false. Money and fame. It divides you, actually. It, you know, you live in more fear than you did before because, you, you know, you, you go up this ladder and you don't want to slide back down it. And I found that this wealth and this celebrity separated me from people. And um, I was acutely aware that my real relationships, you know, my loving relationships with family and friends, even they were jeopardised in it because I was becoming conceited. I started to believe the hype, you know. I was becoming like, well, you know, if everyone says I'm a, I'm a star and, uh, you know, and I'm ace and I'm leader of the pack, then I must be. And so I've become very self-righteous. <laughs> and so I knew that something was going wrong. When you get into celebrity culture and it's all red carpets and glitter and glamour, and you're part of that and you realise actually it's not what it says it is. Show business is a business. And uh, there's a lot of backstabbing. There's a lot of lies. There's a lot of people pretending to be what they're not. Uh, and it was very, I didn't see many people who weren't corrupted by the fame and the fortune. At the height of his fame, Warren began to ask questions about the life that he was now living. Around that time, his wife Dee entered his world. In all honesty, we met on a, a, a drunken night out. There was I nothing, beg your pardon? There was nothing glamorous about it, really. <laughs> I took you um, to the VIP lounge. What are you talking about? <laughs> but, yeah, that's what it was. It was a kind of a drunken night out. I didn't know who he was because I was in a job where I um, I worked for Virgin Atlantic, and so my I never watched telly regularly, so I didn't actually know who he was. He asked me on a date and we were going on this date the next day. And he said, what he said to me was that he was working at the local theatre and I didn't really realise in what capacity. And I remember driving past the theatre and looking up and there was this huge, massive poster of him. He was in his gladiator costume or whatever on this poster. And that thought, sealed the deal. That, that was him from last night. Anyway, that night when I was going to meet him, I remember I got really embarrassed I couldn't actually look him in the eye and I wore this cap because I couldn't look up because I I, I, I kind of was a bit like, oh, okay, so he's somebody. Um, so yeah, that was kind of our, our first official date. As Warren spent more time with Dee, there was something about the way she lived her life that only made him question things further. So the first thing that attracted me to Dee was her look, she's beautiful. But I, as I got to know her, I saw an integrity that I hadn't really seen before. And uh, there was like, a, a, you know, a morality and an integrity about her where she would, she'd forgive people and these, and these things. And I've been in show business so long. And I had such a hard heart, you know, and I'd been in the glitz and the glamour. And the word amazing is such a superfluous word. This is amazing. That's amazing. And in the end, you know, when everything's amazing, nothing is. And so I was so hard hearted. I was like, no, there's nothing amazing. Nothing amazing. There's an answer to everything. And so when... You know, I'm, I, you know, I meet Dee and I see this integrity and I'm like, oh, I was, I was really intrigued by it. Despite Dee's integrity and moral values, she was also in a place where she was looking for more in life. So Warren and Dee went on a journey together to ask life's big questions. When Gladiators finished, he was trying to work out, I suppose, work out his purpose. The big questions. The big questions, yeah. And it, he was... Um, searching all over the place and he, he would look at all different uh, new age teachings he would bring them to me like buddhism and all these kind of things and I would go yeah that's great but not for me and eventually we got asked to go on an alpha course and he asked me if I wanted to go on it and I, and I said what's it about and he said well it's something to do with the church and I was really intrigued and I said yeah I'll come with you so every Wednesday we went to this alpha course after spending weeks on the course, their alpha leader, Ben, challenged Warren to lay down his life in a way he had never done before. I suppose I observed and Warren asked more questions on the course. This one time that Ben said, you know, the, the thing that 
stopping you from accepting God, Warren, is you. You know, you're in the way. And and um, they, they said the prayer of salvation together and Warren really did change. For the first time, I experienced a freedom, a liberation, joy, actually. You know, I'd had happiness before, but my happiness depended on things happening that were conducive, that were good for me. Um, but I'd never experienced joy. I'd never actually experienced um, that peace either or unconditional love. You know, even my relationships with my family were conditional. If I did what they wanted to do or even with my friends, if I, if I was going up the pub every Friday and watching football and drinking five pints, they were my friends. When I said, oh, I don't want to do that, they were like, oh, oh, right, OK. And then they stopped ringing because you're not doing what, what they're doing. And so everything started to change. I started to get an integrity that I didn't have before. And I, I realised now that was an infilling of the Holy Spirit. I was always out to get. And suddenly life became about giving. And, you know, all these divine paradoxes, like it's more blessed to give than to receive, you know, that's complete contradictory to what the world and our culture says. It says about getting and proving yourself. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're giving and, uh, and you're giving something back, but not trying to be a good person. You know, I was, I was still selfish. I wasn't thinking, oh, I need to give back because I need to earn it. I need to be a good person. This wasn't religion. This was the reality of a relationship. After I'd invited Jesus into my life, the Bible started to make sense. You know, I could open up the Bible um, and I could see it was a living word, you know, this inspired words of God. And so, you know, I had suddenly have this, this, um, uh, uh, this manual that's all wisdom gone down through generations guiding my life. Seeing the change in Warren, Dee also found herself faced with a decision to make a commitment to Jesus. I had a, an understanding um, that God existed um, and I'd had some Christian input from my mom's side of the family, um, but I certainly wasn't um, living a Christian life. I, you know, hypocritically thought that I was a Christian. I didn't realise that, you know, I had to do something. I, accept, I had to accept Jesus into my life and live for him and live on purpose for him. And eventually that clicked and, you know, I said this, the prayer of salvation as well. Warren and Dee have since gone on to dedicate their lives to ministry. Ace Active works in schools, in partnership with the community and the church, promoting health and well-being through the message of the gospel. What we essentially we do, we kind of bridge the gap between um, communities, societies and church. So we, we will do anything like going to schools. We do church missions. We have um, a lot of equipment very similar to some of the sort of gladiator fun equipment and we'll do you know family fun days with a gospel message and we try to bridge that gap and you know a lot of people think Christianity is boring and we try to show that it's not boring we reach out into the community you know in places where maybe the church can't reach we'll bridge that gap essentially. My life's been absolutely transformed by the gospel. And so I consider it a divine privilege to be able to go and share that gospel with others. And I, and I like to say to people, listen, you know, don't look at me like I'm some sort of God bother or some Bible basher. That's not who I am. God has a plan on your life. He has created you uniquely as you are. And I think if we buy into any contemporary lies from our celebrity culture that we're not good enough we're already on a spurious path that's going to lead us into uh, dangerous places god doesn't force himself on people because he's unconditional love he's given you the gift of life but he's got another gift for you eternal life should you want to take it
been listening to This Is My Story with Warren and Dee Furman. You can find out more about their ministry, Ace Active, at aceactive.org. Today's episode was hosted by me, Ruth O'Reilly Smith, produced and edited by Ed Jervis. Special thanks to Will Jones. Make sure you subscribe, and for more UCB podcasts, you can download the UCB Player app or search UCB wherever you get your podcasts.